The opening credit sequence unfolds against a backdrop of archival footage showcasing nuclear tests from the 1950s. Additional details in the credits are obscured by strips of white. Scenes depict nuclear detonations, military personnel donning protective gear, and glimpses of ominous Godzilla spines emerging briefly from beneath the waves. The mission is clear, an attempt to eliminate Godzilla. However, the endeavor proves futile, and Godzilla vehemently expresses his disapproval. Fast forward to 1999, where a helicopter labeled Monarch surveys a vast excavation site in the Philippines resembling an open pit mine. Countless workers toil in massive trenches. Touching down, Japanese researcher Ichiro Serizawa Ken Watanabe and his British assistant Vivian Graham, Sally Hawkins, disembark. They are informed by an American supervisor that initial uranium readings prompted extensive preparations, leading to a catastrophic collapse into an underground cavern. Exploring the site, they discover the skeletal remains of an enormous creature that fills the cave. Dangling from the cave ceiling is what appears to be a cocoon, alongside one that seems to have hatched. Further exploration reveals signs of a colossal entity crawling from the cave, leaving a destructive trail towards the sea. Sarazawa and Graham ponder the nature of the creature that emerged from the cocoon. In Japan, at the Janjira Nuclear Power Facility, Joe Brody, Brian Cranston, anxiously addresses concerns about local seismic activity over the phone. He urges the plant shut down as a precaution, despite potential diplomatic tensions. It's Brody's birthday, and his son has crafted a surprise sign. His wife, Sandy Juliette Binoche, rushes their son to school, reminding Brody of the birthday celebration planned by their son. Heading to the plant, Brody presents his case, asserting that the seismic readings are abnormal. Despite his warnings, a tremor strikes the plant, leading to a catastrophic breach. Racing to save his wife, Brody grapples with the decision to seal the protective door, sacrificing her for the greater good. Simultaneously, little Ford Brody, C.J. Adams, witnesses the plant's collapse and evacuation at school, aware that his parents are in jeopardy. In the present day, adult Lieutenant Ford Brody, Aaron Taylor Johnson, returns home after 14 months at sea, eager to reunite with his family. However, a phone call interrupts the joyful homecoming, revealing that his estranged father, Joe Brody, has been arrested in Japan. Ford reluctantly departs for Tokyo, where he bails out his father, revealing Joe's obsessive research into the Janjira incident, marked by a breakdown and strained family ties. Taking pity, Ford suggests that his father come home with him. Joe hasn't seen his grandson in years and desperately needs a break. Joe, however, is adamant about continuing his investigation. He needs to know what happened that day. His wife is still buried in the rubble of the quarantine zone. He mentions that he needs to get back to his house to retrieve his research and sadly shares that he doesn't even have a picture of his wife to cherish. Begrudgingly, Ford decides to help his dad. They head back to the old neighborhood, which looks abandoned and overrun. Suddenly, a pack of dogs gambles through the scene. How could that happen in a radioactive wasteland? Joe checks his Geiger counter which shows no radiation at all. Impulsively, he snatches off his protective headgear and breathes deeply, proving the air is completely safe. Ford is becoming convinced that something is amiss here. They rummage through the house and Joe grabs his 3.5-inch zip disks. He finds a picture of Sandy and turns to see Ford's birthday sign, still strung up after all these years. Meanwhile, Ford finds an old army toy soldier that he pockets. The beating of helicopter blades shakes them from their reverie. As they head outside, they're immediately scooped up by Japanese-speaking security guards and driven to the abandoned nuclear plant. Sarazawa and Graham are talking with some others. They are concerned about activity surrounding an odd cone-shaped organic structure protruding from the surface of the old reactor. Someone interrupts them to say they need to come with him. They are taken to where Joe is being interrogated. He comes across as manic and a little loopy, but Graham confirms that his data is strikingly similar to what they're seeing now. He's the only one left who knows what happened 15 years ago and demands to see his son and get answers regarding the disaster that killed his wife. Back in the main room, the readings confirm that EMP pulses are knocking out their electronics with alarming frequency, just like in 1999. Sarazawa concedes that it's time to kill the program. A steel containment net is lowered and millions of watts of electricity are applied to the chrysalis. 
The massive jolt of electricity appears to destroy the organic pod and the light that pulsated in it dies out. Suddenly, a massive multi-legged creature cracks out of the shell and pounds its clawed leg on the ground, creating an EMP pulse that kills all power in the facility, releasing Joe from his confinement in the process. People are screaming and running as the creature strains against its enclosure. Meanwhile, Ford is still handcuffed in a security vehicle. He watches helplessly as people are slaughtered around him. Suddenly, a support smashes the detainment vehicle he was trapped in and he's free. Joe watches in horror from an elevated walkway as his son faces death. But his own safety is in jeopardy as the bridge is demolished and he tumbles in a horrible fall. Ford dons a gas mask and looks up just in time to see the creature unfurl giant wings and fly off. The next day, Captain Russell Hampton, Richard T. Jones, informs Sarazawa that the U.S. military is taking over. He asks Sarazawa who he needs on his team. He points to Joe, bandaged and on a stretcher. They take Joe and Ford in a military transport. Unfortunately, Joe doesn't survive for long. Sarazawa and the others turn to Ford, asking him if he knows anything about his father's findings. Ford is reluctant to comment on his father's obsessive behavior, but remembers something about echolocation. Sarazawa clues into this, brings Ford into a briefing room, and explains to Ford that the recently hatched Mudo massive unidentified terrestrial organism may be trying to communicate with another giant monster that was found roaming the Pacific a long, long time ago. Sarazawa then presents the same vintage nuclear test footage from 1954 that we see in the opening credits, but with a few crucial details included, mainly a few frames of a familiar giant spiny creature. Sarazawa explains that the nuclear tests weren't tests, they were attempts to kill this creature. This creature had been named Godzilla, and Sarazawa is convinced he is returning, a feeling that is soon confirmed when he is spotted soon thereafter. The naval fleet follows Godzilla. Meanwhile, L freaks out about the news coverage of the Japan damage and can't reach Ford. Since Ford doesn't have much to offer, he's put on a helicopter headed to Hawaii for a flight back home. The Navy confirms that the Mudo is headed across the Pacific. The fleet heads in that direction, flanking Godzilla's spines, which are heading in the same direction. Sarazawa posits that Godzilla is tracking the Muto and wants to fight it to restore balance to nature. In Honolulu, Ford is at the airport, waiting for the train to his terminal. He's playing with the toy soldier and a little Japanese boy becomes fascinated with it. As the boy wanders onto the train without his parents and the doors close, they freak out, but Ford mouths that he will bring their boy back. He hopes that he won't miss his flight. Back to the carrier ship, they've heard that the Russians are missing a nuclear sub. The Mudo eats radiation, which is why the nuclear plant was free of toxic waste. It may have taken the sub as a meal. They send a team into the forest near Honolulu to investigate. The team finds the sub, covered in gooey slime and stuck in a tree. The Mudo is snacking on nuclear fuel canisters. An airborne attack is launched, but the Mudo fires its EMP, knocking out all navigation controls for the jets and sending them plummeting to Earth. At the airport, power is knocked out, including the power to the train at the airport. Ford doesn't realize that the Muto has caused the outage and assures the little boy that the power will come back soon. At a hotel luau, a little girl sees the explosion of the planes in the far-off hills. The crowd is becoming worried as the little girl notices that the sea water seems to be receding from the shore at a rapid pace. Something is displacing an immense amount of water. Very quickly, we see that the thing moving all that water is Godzilla. Honolulu is flooded as the beast reaches ground. The luau and everything else downtown are flooded. At the airport, power is restored, but reveals the Mudo has reached the elevated tracks and the train is headed straight into its jaws. The behemoth shreds the track, sending passengers to their doom. Ford barely hangs on, grabbing the kid before he slides out of the mangled train. Godzilla squares off against the Mudo, but it manages to escape, flapping its giant wings and continuing its journey to the mainland. Back in San Francisco, Elle is asking her son to go to bed as he watches the developing destruction on the news. The whole world now knows that the Mudo and Godzilla exist. Back on the ship, they're tracking the Mudo's path. Looks like it's headed to San Francisco. Graham and Sarazawa realize that it must be headed to the other Mudo, long thought dead. Unfortunately, the dangerously radioactive body has been stored in the midst of an unlimited food supply, 
the Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Facility in Nevada. Troops arrived to discover that the Mudo, now confirmed as a female, has escaped and is making a path to meet her mate. The path leads directly through Las Vegas. The second Mudo is much larger and more powerful than the first and lumbers straight through Las Vegas, destroying whatever lies in its path. The Navy has hatched a plan to lure the two Mudos offshore with a nuclear missile. Godzilla will be close behind. Then they'll detonate the bomb, wiping out all three monsters. Graham is amazed at the short-sightedness of the plan. Because the Mudos eat radiation, she and Sarazawa believe the plan won't work. Captain Hampton claims that nothing can survive the power of the newer bombs. Sarazawa isn't convinced. Meanwhile, after delivering the boy to his parents in devastated Honolulu, Ford hops onto a Navy transport headed to the mainland. A train is being prepared to transport the two weapons, the bait and the killer bomb. Ford shoehorns himself into the detail, citing his expertise in ordnance handling. The bombs will be transported by train to the coast where the plan will be set into motion. Things seem to be going just fine until a tremor stops the train right before a treacherous mountain bridge. The team attempts to radio ahead, but the screams over the walkie-talkie don't bring good news. Uncertain if the bridge is even there, they break into two groups. It looks okay at first, but the female Mudo has been lying in wait. It smashes the bridge, gobbles down one of the nukes, and kills everybody on the train, except for Ford, who jumps into the river just as the bridge is shattered. By morning, a recovery team has found Ford in the nuke. They'll fly the remaining bomb and try to make do with a modification of the initial idea. The president approves. Sarazawa comments on the arrogance of man, thinking that we can control nature when it's the other way around. The two Mudos are headed for their reunion in San Francisco, with Godzilla in close pursuit. The Navy has been tacitly tolerating the monster as it has expressed no direct threat to the ships, but they are committed to destroying them all despite Sarazawa's protests. Ford has called Elle at the hospital to assure her he's on his way, and asks her to please wait for him. Meanwhile, the whole city is prepping for an emergency evacuation. Elle wants to keep her son with her, but relents, trusting his care to a co-worker. Evacuation buses are stalled on the Golden Gate Bridge as troops and tanks position themselves against the kaiju threat. The Navy has rigged the bomb with an analog countdown timer to avoid being disabled by Mudo's EMP. They set the clock when a winged Mudo attacks. He's looking for a snack for his mate and delivers the bomb to her. The larger Mudo tears up part of Chinatown to make a nest for their offspring. The nuke will offer nutrition until they hatch. Godzilla, sensing his prey, emerges from the depths right by the Golden Gate Bridge. The troops attack instinctively, inciting Godzilla to tear through the bridge. The bus driver sees his chance and barrels through barricades to take his charges to safety. Ford, though injured, claims he can disarm the trigger in about 60 seconds. He's on the team for a risky halo jump into San Francisco to grab the bomb, defuse it, and make one last try to blow the monsters to smithereens. They make the jump, only losing a couple of guys when Godzilla shows up ready to fight the monsters. Godzilla is doing pretty well against the smaller, winged male, but when the big female leaves the nest to help, they join up to attack Godzilla. The troops have found the nest and the nuke, but the casing is damaged and they can't disarm it there. They begin to move it to a boat where they have more tools and can send it away from the city. The fight between the giants continues in the city where the Mudos are ruthlessly jabbing their hooks into Godzilla's massive body. He looks done for but continues to fight them. Back at the nest, Ford sees thousands of eggs and realizes they're an even bigger threat. Lagging behind, he pops off the covers on spouts from a destroyed tanker truck to flood the chamber with gasoline. Godzilla's fight with the Mudos seems to be turning to his enemy's advantage. He's been mangled by the Mudos, when suddenly the nest explodes destroying all the eggs and sending the female screaming back to the nest in a panic. This is just the break Godzilla needs. He gets his second wind and re-engages with the flying Mudo. Air superiority appears to give Mudo an edge, but Godzilla's long spiked tail knocks the Mudo into a building, killing it. Meanwhile, Ford has been caught in the aftershock of the explosion. The female Mudo grieves the loss of the babies but smells the nuke and heads back to grab it. I know.